If you're going to talk, you better talk about it. Because he's about the only thing that's worth mentioning that can change. See, a lot of times people talk all day and nothing ever changes. But if you bring him into the equation, there's going to be sudden changes that come in. Anytime, anytime he ever passed by or came into or walked amongst something that was not right, what happened? It straightened up and it got right. If they was blind, they started seeing. If they was deaf, they started hearing. If they was lame, they started walking. Even to the point that they was dead and in a funeral procession. He raised the widow's son of Nain up. Everything he entered into where there was faith, it immediately changed. And then the word says when he came to his own hometown, he could there do no mighty works. Why? Because of their unbelief. But what did he do? The Bible said he led a few sick folks outside of the city and he healed them there. The environment in which we provide for the Lord to work and move is just as important as the moving itself. The atmosphere that we create when we come together is just as important as the actual meeting itself. When you have an atmosphere that's charged with faith and hunger, and when your spirit man is reaching out for something great in God, God cannot walk away from a heart that is persistent and wanting the presence of the Lord to manifest in its midst. Hallelujah. He'll climb over ten unbelievers to find one heart that is tuned in to the supernatural. And I don't know about you, but I want to be that one in every environment that is tuned in enough that the Lord knows when He enters the room that somebody is laying hold of the supernatural in the faith realm. Glory to God. And it's by faith that we see the hand of God extended out in this place. Hallelujah. He don't work by need. He don't work just by excitement. He moves by faith. By faith. By faith. By me believing that it's going to be the way the Word of God has declared it to be. Can you say amen? Let's sing the Word is working this morning. Oh, the Word is working mightily in me. The Word is working mightily in me. Word. I have what I heard. 
this day for this meeting this house and these people we thank you for this service that we're entered into now we thank you for the services that will go on here later today and this evening as well we loose the mighty anointing of God the presence of Jesus all over this house we thank you for the tangible touch of your glory and your anointing we thank you for the revelation of your word we thank you that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will operate fully and fluently and freely here today that the eyes of our understanding would be flooded with light and that we would come into a marvelous knowledge of your word and your power and your spirit today oh god in jesus name we loose that anointing to go out and touch the people of god even as they sit here today if they're in pain if they have sickness in their body let the healing river flow over and through them. Make them entirely and ever with whole, we pray in the name of Jesus today. Hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost have free reign. Let the Holy Ghost take preeminence. Move and guide it the way you'd have it to go. Steer it like a ship, Lord, and bring it into its course. Hallelujah. We release the Holy Ghost upon your people today. Let everybody that comes in here today get freshly filled, freshly healed, and freshly touched by the glory and the anointing of God. We thank you today for utterance. We thank you for inspiration. We thank you, Lord, today for unction from the Holy One. Hallelujah. And we receive of your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning. Hallelujah. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3. Second Corinthians 3, we're going to start in verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You know, there was a dream that was shared with me one day that, uh, I don't know if you've ever been over to the parsonage, but it was on the, the back porch. And they were going to that backyard and they heard people speaking. And when they went into that back porch, they saw the group of people that they didn't want to embrace the spirit part of this kingdom message. They only wanted the letter. And it says there that the letter killeth and the spirit brings life. And they were just talking about the letter of the word, just the, just the words, just the knowledge. And they were serving up pineapple. And when they looked inside the pineapple, the pineapple was rotten. Because again, the letter killeth and the spirit brings life. But then out in the backyard, this person saw people dancing around and they were embracing the word and the spirit together. And their pineapples were big and they were fruitful and they were juicy. And that's what the Lord, he does in this new covenant when we don't just take it as a knowledge you know april talked about that oh are you this was very true that there were some people that they were so-called 
theologians that they knew the word backwards and forwards could quote about 90% of the Bible to you, but they had no relationship, no revelation with that word. And it was just as dull and just as dry because they didn't have the innermost being. They didn't let that spirit revelation come forth. They knew the word. They knew of it, but they didn't know it. Hallelujah. There's so many uh, people that you will meet that they know of God. They know of the knowledge of God. They know the knowledge of the word. They know that the Lord saves and heals, but that's all they know is the knowledge of it. They don't embrace it. They don't take a relationship of it. They don't embrace his son into their life. They just know it by the letter. There's some people, it's where I teach, it's very much known as a, it's a small town. And to save face, about everybody and their mother goes to church every Sunday morning just to be seen. Some are there for the relationship, but many of them are just there to be seen and say, okay, I'm a good person. I went to church this morning. But without the revelation, without the relationship of the Lord, and allowing Him to take full control of our life and allowing His Spirit to breathe upon us, all inside of us is death. When we were in that old religion, that old covenant, that it, as, as Pastor says, you don't throw the tub out with the bath water, the baby out with the bath water, because what we were taught was good, but it's not enough for this present day. This present day, we have to have the Spirit and the revelation breathing upon us. To let manifestation and life be within us. I was, uh, there was a couple of days last week that I was working and I was, I went out to lunch with my team and one of my team members' cousins came in and the doctors keep saying that the baby inside of her womb, even though she keeps getting bigger, is dead. And he kept saying that we'll take the baby and everything. And while I was sitting there, it just came upon me. And the Lord said, just I spoke up, because I don't always speak up, but the Lord had me impressed to tell her that I said, you wouldn't believe the number of babies that had been born inside my church and in my family that they were supposed to be dead or something terribly wrong with them, and they are perfectly normal children. I said, the Lord can change this just like that if we believe for it, because they just kept talking about God's will. They didn't know what God's will was. God's will is that you have life and that you have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. And she just kept saying that, but when I did that, it was quite... Uh, funny because one of my, uh, my f f uh, colleague whose cousin that was, she's like, oh, I feel that. Oh, I feel like goosebumps. She goes, that word is true. And so I checked in with her on uh, Friday. We were cleaning the church. And I was just like, because her cousin was supposed to go in for a procedure. And I said, did they take the baby? How's your cousin doing? She goes, she's, she's doing good, but they wouldn't take the baby because they found amniotic fluid around its face. And they said before that there was no amniotic fluid that the baby had lost oxygen. So they're going to wait another week. And I'm just believing in this week's time that the Lord, if he can do that, <laughs> and already show that girl that there was a change, I believe that he can completely transform that baby within her womb, that it would be there. I think of uh, Janelle and Chris with JJ. At first, they told Janelle that that baby was going to have all these things wrong with it. And they hadn't quite picked a name yet for that child. And we went on a trip to Tennessee. And there was this road that we passed that was called Josiah Clark Road. And at first, Chris saw that. And he was like, huh. He's like, look at that. <laughs> there was Clark Road and, he's, and Josiah. And he looked up that name Josiah because he just couldn't get that name of that road off his mind. And he looked up that name Josiah and it said it means Jehovah has healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord can give revelation on that. Yeah. You see, he didn't just accept the doctor's report. He let the spirit breathe on it. And Josiah is completely normal, intelligent boy today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, even mom and I were talking about this, that when we, uh, back before, when we were just starting to get revelation on things, that we used to always accept the doctor's report. Right. You know, if I was at 
work and I went and I had a cold or something and I went to the doctor and he said, okay, uh, you're going to be, this is going to take such and such amount of days. I believed every word of it. It's going to take such and such amount of days. Get over this. And I just, you don't accept it. Because when you accept the doctor's report, you accept death and flesh and everything. When you accept the letter, there's only death. But with the Spirit, when you let the Spirit breathe upon the other, it brings life. You know, we, we share many times about Sister Marie's sister, my grandmother, my great-grandmother Blair. She never accepted the doctor's report. She would, when the doctor would tell her things were wrong with her, she would just stare up into a corner of the ceiling. And my nana would be like, Mother, don't you understand? Mm. They would try to explain, do you understand what the doctor's saying? She'd go, nah, I don't have any of that. She wouldn't accept the doctor's report. I remember someone sharing a story that there was a certain, this is back in the 70s, so I'm not sure which president it was, but there was a certain president that this lady did not want to be. She was going for the other candidate. And there was a friend of hers that knew, and she saw the report that the other candidate won. And she went to her because she figured she'd just be devastated. And she went to her, and she said, so what do you think about the other candidate winning the presidency? And she goes, I'm just going to pretend like the whole time that it never happened. And that's what we have to do. When we receive bad reports, bad circumstances, no matter what it is, we have to pretend like it never happened. We have to speak what the Word of God says upon it. We can't let those thoughts of doubt rest within our head. we got to let the Spirit bring life upon it. Hallelujah. And if with your natural mouth, you can't speak positivity at the time. Then you let your words come out and you pray in the spirit. And then sometimes if you can't even pray in the spirit, you put on worship music. There was a, one day, it was just it was stupid. If you've ever had that, or you ever had one of those days where you just feel like crying. And you're like, why do I feel like crying? I have nothing to cry over. This is just dumb. So what I always do is I put on some worship music. You know what? It don't take very long, maybe five minutes. All of that feeling of feeling like crying or feeling overwhelmed or anguish or whatever, it just succeeds because worship brings in the glory of the Lord and allows the Spirit to breathe upon it. And the Lord says, you have no need. There's, there should be no Christian that is depressed or oppressed. It's against the Word of God. It says that it is illegal for you to worry. Because Philippians 4, 6 says, do not worry about everything, about anything. But instead, let the Lord know the need, and he shall give you peace. Hallelujah in there. And we're going to start again and go to verse 7. It says, now with the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory. We're talking about the Ten Commandments that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Well, the answer to that is yes. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. His red a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Yeah. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
You know, I was on Facebook the other day, and uh, Francois Dutois, he's the guy that is translating the mirror translation of the Bible. He said something very simple, but yet very profound. He said, I am, not I'm trying to, is God's reflection mirrored in us. So you're not trying to be a Christian. You are one. You are Jesus. When you say, I am him, you take on his full identity, even if you don't know the full realms of it. His oneness revealed in us unto the spirit of grace is only mirrored in favor. His favor only brings goodness when we join up with his oneness and take the veil of religion, Moses' law, off of our eyes to reveal the glory of the Lord. You see, before this kingdom message was fully revealed to us, we had that veil over our eyes. I know I did. And when all of a sudden, when everything came to fruition, and the Lord kept revealing little things here and there, he was taking the veil off slowly and slowly and slowly. It, it took a process. Some people, it, it was instantaneous. With me, it was a little bit of a process. Because the Lord would say, mm, no, this is not right. This is... You are the mansion of the Lord. It's not a physical mansion in heaven. You are the mansion of the Lord. You're his dwelling place. And then it came to a time the Lord was revealing things to me while I was in college. And then the first time I came home for a break, the first message that pastor preached on was the order of Melchizedek. And as Rita said, she said, when I saw you, girl, I didn't even know you, but you look like you're about to fly over them pews when you got that. Because it was when he said, you are the king and the priest. Because in this old realm, it was like, you know, the Lord was going to be over you. And if you make one little mistake, he was going to beat you down. That's how I viewed the Lord before I really knew who he was as father. That he was my daddy. And I learned that. The Lord instructed me. Hallelujah. And I learned that. And he said that you are a king and a priest unto God. And it does not make us humble to be poor. It does not make us humble to be sick. The, it, nowhere in the word does it say that God's people should be poor or sick. And if you're finding yourself poor or sick, you need to get more in the spirit of the Lord. You need to embrace it that your word says. I mean, there are some times that, that I wake up and it feels like a truck has hit me in the morning. All pain all over my body. Just feel all groggy. But you know what? I get up and sometimes I do like Smith Wigglesworth. When I feel that on me, I'll throw those covers back and I'll do a little dance before the Lord. And I say, no, that is not going to be how it is today. Hallelujah. I remember uh, last week, I had been doing a lot of uh, pulling and moving around and stuff. And my shoulder was just so sore. It was just ran from my neck to there. But I just was like, nope, this ain't staying. This is not going here. And April, right first thing, the first 10 minutes of Sunday school, April said, I feel like there's just healing going in here. And I received it, and I could just feel the warmth and the glory of the Lord. And within 30 minutes, every bit of that pain was gone. Because you have to believe for it. You have to accept it. There, I was listening to Jesse Du Planets this morning, and somebody was sharing a testimony before they started listening to him that they used to always believe that they would gradually pay for things. And he said, so I went from believing that I would just gradually pay for things, that I started believing for things, and then it started coming to pass. Bill Winston, he said, he's talking about you know physical jobs, that like you don't work for man, you work for God. And he said on your job, no matter how cruel your boss is, no matter how terrible and hard the situation of the job is, that if you do your job wholeheartedly unto the Lord, that the Lord will promote you. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've seen that happen in my own life. 
I went, uh, there was, uh, it was my fourth year of teaching. We went, I went from being very highly favored. I was a grade chair with my last principal. But when I got a new principal, he didn't like it that I was, I guess, one of my past principal's favorite. And he tried to make me lose my job for a year and try to make, paint this image that I was just this terrible teacher. But the Lord was in that. I didn't become bitter about it. The whole time I didn't have a job, I would wake up and I would pray and I would play worship music. And that's what I would do. And I would say, I thank you, Lord. You have the job. You have the right appointed time. And I would do things. And I would just embrace that. I was like, even though it wasn't working, I would just embrace that downtime. And I was just like, Lord, you got this. And that's what I would do. I'd go around the house and I, you know, I had some chores to do, but I would just play worship music or I'd play preaching or that because you have to let the Lord get on the inside of you. And then the Lord used a, a principal. She kept seeing my name and she called me in and she said, I know how he is, but I'm not him. And I want you and I'm going to help build you back up because I'm sure he's probably broken down all your confidence. And she did. And now, this year, the state of Florida of education told the district to choose me of some of the, we're called innovator teachers. And we get paid extra for people to come in and watch us model teach. So the Lord can do anything upon it. And the thing is, that's the thing is, me as a teacher, I never worked for the man. I always worked for God. Because I knew he appointed me to be a teacher. Hallelujah. When I was in high school, I tell people that, because some people were like, man, I bet you want to be a teacher your whole life. I said, no, that's not true. <laughs> that didn't change till my senior year. I had, I told mom one time, you know, sometimes they say, don't ever say you'll never do something. But I remember telling mom, I said, I will never be a teacher. That will be the last job I will ever, ever do. And then my senior year, they put me in this teacher academy and I fell in love with teaching and the Lord told me what I was going to study and he told me where I was going to go <laughs> and here we are today I'll be starting my 10th year of it and I still love it because when the Lord puts you in a place <laughs> in a place mom says I've been put in a place called there <laughs> when he puts you in a place called there because you let the spirit breathe upon it it's just so easy and even when there's drama around you and other people aren't happy, the Lord will still give you joy. <laughs> my, my new administration, they said, Meg, I, I don't think we'd ever know if you were upset. Because you even when it seems like, man, she must be having a tough day, you still got a smile on your face. Because it's the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. You can't, you can't let people, you got to let it just go over you like a duck. <laughs> Water over a duck's back. It don't sink in. It just rolls right off of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as just even the, talking about the veil, even an, a natural bride, because you know we are his bride. If a natural bride went up to get married, and it got to the point, you know, at the end where they said, all right, you may, uh, kiss your bride and the husband takes the veil off and with the seals his name on you with a kiss if we as Christians because when we don't believe all what the word says and what all the spirit says that's like saying to the Lord I came to the ceremony but I didn't become your wife because you didn't let him take the veil off because if you saw a, someone that got married, let's say mom, mom, how long have you been married for? 36. 36 years. If mom was still wearing a veil on her head, everybody look at her like she was crazy. My dad definitely would be like, probably by that time, probably would have had the marriage in old. If she just still was wearing her wedding dress and the veil and didn't become a wife. And that's what we say to the Lord when we don't trust him and when we allow mixture to come in them and we speak those words of doubt, we're saying we're not the, we're not the Lord's wife. But when we allow him to take off the veil of all old law, old condemnation, you know, it sometimes even if you're taught wrong, the Lord can take it off of you, make you forget everything. Hallelujah. And put the right image. Because the more that we allow ourselves to come deeper into the Lord, the more mysteries that he reveals unto us. And he'll take it off. 
Sometimes that veil, I say the veil that was over our eyes, it's like an onion. And he just peels layer off a layer off a layer off of us. But you think about it, the more that in the natural relationship with a husband and a wife, the longer they know each other and they get intimate with each other, the more they know about each other. That sometimes your mate knows you better than yourself. Because, and you don't realize that. Even in a natural job, you know, as a, I had one co-teacher that I taught with for three years, and she, if I went to a restaurant, she could about order my meal for me because we, you know, saw each other every, almost every day, and it just comes like that. But it's like that's how your relationship with the Lord is. The more you allow Him to come into you, because He's always there, and the more you allow His Spirit breathe upon you, and the more you allow yourself to experience the glory, the more you know Him. And you know the desires for His life. And the more that your identity is in you. You know, I, I think of Old Roberts and Billy Graham and A.A. Allen and all of these ministers that people compared them to Jesus. They said, if I can get to Him, it is the same as touching Jesus. And that's how it should be in our lives, that when people see us and they encounter us, that they know, that they experience Jesus within us. I mean, how many times we, I mean, we experience this all the time. When we go into a restaurant or a store or something, all of a sudden we'll see somebody and their eyes will just get big around. And sometimes they flee and sometimes they want to just come up to us. Because they see Jesus within us. And some of them, they, they feel the condemnation they've been in their life, so they flee. And sometimes they know that it's what's there, and they want to be free. And that's what the Lord is saying. If you allow the Spirit, the Lord gives liberty, gives freedom. I think of Rick Manis. He always talks about being crazy free in the Lord. Some of us, we don't want to lose control. We don't, we don't want to do, because you see people, you'll see people shouting around here, and you'll see people falling out, and you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to lose that control. But it, you don't lose control. The Lord has ordained it. And I've seen people that they've both taken off, of, I remember my Aunt Charlotte, my mom, one time when I was younger, they took off and they were running, they were over on that side of the church, and we are all like, oh, they're about to have a collision. And I don't even know how that happened. But somehow they just went right past each other. Because the Lord has order and control. What you think as you see is wild and out of control. The Lord always has order upon it. Hallelujah. On Wednesday night, you know, it, it didn't. In the natural, me walking up this aisle, I shouldn't have been getting drunker and drunker in the glory. But because I allow the Spirit to breathe upon me. <laughs> And I come expecting. That's the thing. you got to come expecting. Because if you're going to sit there and you're like, just move me if you can, a lot of times you will not be moved. But when you allow the Spirit to come upon you, His glory, His glory, His presence just comes in. And when we unify together, His glory gets stronger. And we see manifestations. If the Lord took off this natural veil of the earth realm off your eyes, you would, some people would be about ready to jump out the window if they saw all the clouds of witnesses and the angels and the glory of the Lord up in this place. Because you see, the more we allow the Spirit to go within us with that heavenly kiss, that's what the Lord's full mission, Jesus Christ's full mission, is that the earth kisses heaven. And the heavens kiss the earth and they join together in unity. Because you see those clouds of witnesses, they learn right along with us. When we have this word, this revelation word, they come up in here all the time and they sit and they listen to it. Hallelujah. And they dance and they shout before it. I've seen them many times, many times come in this place. And there's just even more miracles, the miraculous abides here. And it's not just this physical building, it's because it abides within us. It abides in this dwelling house. We are the temple of the Lord, embracing it. And within us is a river and that river flows out because we allow the veil to come off of us. We allow the veil. We allow ourselves to be a bride and we're a reflection of it. And we embrace love 
because God is love. Hallelujah. He abides within us and we abide in Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And His mercy and grace lets us dwell together in freedom. Hallelujah. As we travel from glory unto glory, that no veil can hide your face like Moses did. No veil. If we keep getting deeper in this, there's no veil. Nothing can hide your identity in Him. In the natural, you know, like... The president, he, he is seen as always the face of a country or a ruler or a king or whoever it is. They're the face of it, of a country. Celebrities like athletes, some of them are the face of that certain thing. And they can go in the natural, and let's say they're going to a restaurant, and they can try to hide themselves, disguise themselves. But as soon as one little glimpse of that, and somebody f discovers who they are, all of a sudden, pictures are taken and the paparazzi come around and they're and they those face those pictures are shared and they're worth thousands and sometimes a million dollars just to have that picture taken but you see when we allow his face of glory it's worth more than any picture hallelujah he sees so much worth within us hallelujah <laughs> So much worth it in us. <laughs> We're the apple of his eye. Yes, we are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He, he, when we embrace him, he tells others, he lets others know <laughs> they're mine. You can't touch him. <laughs> they're mine. Because favor is not fair. <laughs> his favor comes upon him. Hallelujah. In all situations, when we abide in this, that like I said, you know, uh, they'll say the Bartow crud. <laughs> That's what they'll call it whenever a sickness will go around. And they'll, people will notice, why aren't you getting sick? Because I don't believe that dwells within me. When everybody, the Lord can give you wisdom on things. Um, I know some people that they do the stock market. And the Lord will give them knowledge and they'll say sell. And they'll protect them. And people will come in and they'll lose everything. But yet the Lord gave them knowledge about that. The Lord will say here and go there. I just think of on a Thursday. There is a, I was going to leave at 4 o'clock. That was my intention in my classroom. And I, was, I wanted to finish one last thing. And the Lord kept saying, man, you'll feel happy if you just finish that one last thing. And I was getting aggravated at first because my stapler wasn't working. I wasted probably about 20 to 30 staples. It just wouldn't go in the wall. And I was just going to give up on it. And the Lord said, no, you want to finish that. Just go ahead and finish it. Well, I found out why the Lord had a delay on that. And why I was so determined to finish that one little thing. Because when on my way home, there was an accident about five cars. And it, what I looked at, from the side of the road that I was going to be on, there, I remember there's a side road that you about can't see it because there's trees on each side. And there's this big gate, I guess like for cattle or farm or whatever. And when I looked, that gate was on the other side of the road in a ditch. And there were all those people, and even one person died. And the Lord, it, it, the Lord was protecting me. Because if I had left at the time that I was going to leave, I would have been involved in that. And so sometimes what we see is a delay. I, that's where I just don't even much anymore. I just laugh. If there's some delay, I just don't much get upset about it because I'm like, our delays are God's assignments. Yeah. And sometimes the Lord is setting up for you. Sometimes it's not just avoiding that. He's setting up for you that you walk in. And it might be something that's just simple walking in the bank. And you come in at a certain time and that's just when the right person is there. He sets you up for appointments. His favor sets you up. He gives you inside information. Hallelujah. There's many times that before someone decides to pass on in this earth, the Lord will let me know before it happens. He'll prepare you. And sometimes some people see that as a bad thing, but the Lord will give you peace about it. There were a lot of people that were shocked. I don't know if you ever knew the preacher, Billy Joe Daughtery. 
And he wasn't a very old man when he decided to go on. But he had had some sickness, and but he wanted to see his son get married to the Lord. He got a lot better, and everybody just thought he was going to recover. And he wasn't sick at the time that he went. He was just sitting there, and the Lord revealed to his wife that he wanted to go on. And she said, I'll miss you, but you're, I know you're wanting to go on. And he chose to go on, and he just went to sleep. And he was only in his late 50s. But he decided that he was ready to go on, and the Lord gave her peace about it. Because in the natural, when someone's that young, you know, you could just go berserk. But the Lord gives you peace about things. He'll let you know. And what interesting enough was when that happened, both I and my roommate, we didn't know anything was going on with him. Because everybody was like, he's doing better. Because he had a church right across the street from ORU. And both I and my roommate that night had a dream that he had went on. And it was so... Uh, so, you know, so had my roommate enticed with it that she's like, I gotta see if he went on. So she turned on the news and there it was. First thing, right when we turned on the news, Pastor Billy John Daugherty has passed away. And the Lord let us know about it. Hallelujah. The Lord just gives you things that in revelation that sometimes you'll, you think you're not going to handle it, but you will. The Lord allows you to ex experience him in person, so sincere a relationship that he downloads himself into your innermost, your innermost thoughts. Your, we call it an education, your schema. It's your inside brain. It's like a filing cabinet. And he'll put that. And he'll erase the bad and replace it with the good. Hallelujah. Until you only reflect him. Hallelujah. And it overtakes any trace of your old carnal flesh. And let's, uh, as we end here, let's turn to uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 8 through 17. And it says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall. Gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. That's what the Lord is saying to us. Every time that we get a new revelation, he's saying, Arise, come to a deeper level in me. Let me show you things. Hallelujah. Let me heal you here. Let me give you peace here. Let my goodness and my mercy overshadow this situation here. And in verse 10, my beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom, and they give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away, O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, and in the crannies of the cliff. Let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. For our vineyards are in the blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He graces among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, turn my beloved, be like a gazelle, or a young stag on cleft mountains. Hallelujah. He brings us to the high places in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He brings us to the high places. Hallelujah. Where the church the bride of Christ, <laughs> we allow our beloved to become fully immersed in us, that all we see is Jesus in heaven within us. I, re I remember reading, if you've ever read Harvest Glory by Ruth Ward Heflin, she tells about all these different places, and my Lord, did she have favor, because she allowed the Spirit to breathe upon her. She allowed the veil to be taken off her eyes of old religion. And there was one time she was doing a camp meeting, and there was a, a lovely couple, she said, that they said, after service, we want to take a picture of you. And they took 
a, quite a few pictures. And when they got the pictures developed, they were like, something happened. Something was wrong here. They are like, look, we can see the bottom of your body, but all around your head, it's like this huge cloud. Something didn't develop here. And the Lord revealed to her that it was the glory cloud. Hallelujah. That was being reflected, even in the natural. Hallelujah. See, that's what the Lord does when we allow his anointing and his glory. Hallelujah. He can cause it to physically manifest. Hallelujah. How often do we see that physical manifestation of the glory of the Lord? It can be shared in joy. He can cause a heavenly joy to come upon you. He can cause a shout, a dance. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but we've seen it many times. Or if it's cool, it would be like misty in here. Like physical rain of this glory. I remember one night, and I saw it myself. I was sitting over here, and uh, Winnie and my dad, they kept saying, what is that light? There was this light that kept beating all around. And at first they thought it was one of those lights. And that's, then they realized, no, <laughs> that's just the glory <laughs> coming in. Hallelujah. And we just... Thank you, Lord, today that more and more, more and more and more <laughs> revelation, hallelujah, and manifestation and willingness to allow the Lord's spirit just come deeper within us, to allow his identity. Because you can hold back and, and of people, Moses David said that their, the veil was not only over their face, but it was over their hearts. The Lord can soften any stony heart, hallelujah. Hallelujah, that we allow ourselves. You know, as um, Michelle O'Donnell, she was when she was first getting revelation of the kingdom of the divine love of the Lord, there was, the pastor would tell her, say, you might not understand it, but put it on the shelf for later, and I'll reveal it to you. So even if some things completely like flabbergast you, and they're like, I don't really get that, Lord, just put it on the shelf, and the Lord will reveal the mystery unto you. Hallelujah. Be blessed.